Hi, everyone. Eric here. Before we get to this week's episode with Hannah Ryder, I just want to make sure that you know about our daily China Africa email newsletter. Now, you know that this story is moving so fast on issues related to debt relief, race relations, and of course, COVID-19. We cover the story in more detail than anyone else. Analysts, journalists, researchers all say they really like the newsletter and find it valuable because we put in a lot of primary source information. Also, with your subscription, you'll have unlimited access to exclusive analysis, the archives, and our China Africa Experts Network. We hope you'll try it out. It's free for two weeks. Let us know what you think and half off for students and scholars. For more information, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. That's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher from the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it has been a really a dramatic week in China-Africa relations, something that we haven't seen before. Let's kind of walk back over the past, say, six or seven days as to what's happened. Uh, about a week ago, this was last Wednesday or Thursday from the time that we're recording this, we started to get some reports of, you know, I, I don't know how to frame it, alleged maltreatment, maltreatment. We'll kind of put that out for our discussion later on. But that fact was that there were African migrants who were being kind of pushed out onto the streets. They were being evicted from their homes. They were being asked to leave. Lots, again, the language here is very, very sensitive. I'm not entirely sure how to phrase it, and I want to give myself a little bit of room simply because I wasn't there. But the most important thing is that it caused a social media firestorm. That firestorm then prompted uh, reaction in Africa uh, at a number of, in a number of different countries, a number of different foreign ministries, and it prompted some real unprecedented things that we've, I mean, truly, that we've never seen in all of diplomacy. Let me walk through a little bit before we get into our discussion today of kind of what we call the TikTok. So going back to last Friday, one of the key milestones was when Nigeria Speaker of the House of Representatives called in Chinese ambassador to Abuja in Nigeria, uh, Zhou Pingjian, and really started to read him the riot act and then posted a video on Twitter of the interaction. And that is something that we've never seen before. Let's take a listen to what the what Zhou Pingjian had to listen to from the Nigerian Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, how you treat our ambassador is very important, mm. very, very important, mm. and I'm glad you did that. But how you treat our citizens is more important. Uh, I know, yes, yes, how you treat the ambassador. Yes, yes. So, I, mean, I, just, want to, I, just, I just want to thank you, I'm sure you know, my, my colleagues will have some comments as well. You, you said you haven't seen any of the videos that are, that are out there. I'm at liberty to show them to you. Everybody has a phone if you want, if that will convince you, because you've said you haven't had an official complaint. So at this point, then, we're seeing Ambassador Joe leaning over a phone and watching these videos. That prompted an enormous reaction on Nigerian social media and really across Africa. And there was this sense of you know, agency and empowerment in this, I've taken it to the Chinese. Finally, somebody's stepping up for Nigerians. There really was that sense on social media, and that then kind of spread to a number of other instances. Now, by the time Sunday came around, the Chinese started to mobilize a response, and they started to come back with an idea that said, and it was really divided into a number, of, of two or three main points. Number one, there is no discrimination in China. They treat all people equally and fairly. Uh, number two, they said these were rumors and allegations. And later they started to evolve that sentiment towards that these were rumors and allegations that were being propagated by the United States in particular. And then and there's a key word here, there would be no wedge draw, driven between China and Africa. And that wedge word was put forward by Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman, spokeswoman Hua Chunyin. 
And then later, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian uh, pu started publishing a regular series of tweets following up with his regular press briefings. And here's one of the statements that he said, the Chinese government has attached high importance to the health and safety of foreign nationals in China. We treat them equally and reject any discriminatory measures in our outbreak response. So the Chinese line started to come around saying that people were not being evicted from their house. They were being asked to undergo quarantine and to adhere with the uh, Chinese regulations related to the COVID-19 outbreak. Separately, there were a lot of concerns about the number of Nigerians in Guangzhou who were not registered or on expired visas. A lot of landlords got nervous and they asked people to leave because they thought the authorities would come and get them in trouble. Let's now fast forward to Tuesday or Wednesday, and we start to see the relationship and the dynamic of this whole situation change a lot. Uh, Chinese diplomats started to fan out across the continent uh, on, on Monday. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi starts working the phones. We'll go back to, uh, to the African Union, to Musa Faki Mahmat, uh, chairperson of the African Union Commission. He spoke with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Monday, and he wrote, Quote, on Twitter, he reassured me of measures underway in Guangzhou to improve the situation of Africans in line with the strong and brotherly partnership between Africa and China. Notice that word brotherly. That's the same language that the Chinese use to define the relationship between China and Africa. So that was very, very interesting. By, let's say, Tuesday and Wednesday, we started now to see a complete turn in Nigeria. And I want to bring you to a press conference that was uh, from uh, Foreign Minister Jeffrey Onyema, where he basically said, you know what, we are done with this issue. We have accepted the Chinese explanation for it. And he and Zhou Pingjian are now uh, at this whole this press conference. Let's listen to what Foreign Minister Jeffrey Onyema had to say. We are on top of the situation. I have to um, express our profound gratitude to the ambassador of China here in Nigeria. He acted immediately and reached uh, the most important uh, uh, elements in the Chinese government hierarchy. Uh, the reaction of the government has been very, very quick. And, um, and, and so they're now working together as a team. It's unfortunate that the, 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 the government in Guangdong uh, did not reach out early enough to our authorities, uh, consulate uh, in uh, Guangdong and uh, Shanghai and Beijing. But now that communication has been established, and they're now working together as a team, communicating and letting everybody know that these measures are to assure the safety of the Nigerians, as well as everybody in China, and in particular in uh, Guangdong uh, province, where this uh, outbreak uh, originated. Let me wrap up now this, this, uh, this week-long kind of ordeal that's been going on, back to the Nigerian Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, who wrote on Twitter yesterday, uh, I'm glad the matter of maltreatment of Nigerians in China has been sorted out between both countries. The ambassador, Zhou Pingjian, has communicated his findings, and we hope that moving forward, communication will be swift and clear, and due process will be observed. Wow, Kobus, that was quite a week. We went from a firestorm to everybody's happy. Give us a little bit of a sense before we get into our conversation with Hannah today. How are you processing all this? This is was fascinating to watch. Um, it, it kind of wrapped up roughly how I expected it would. Um, I thought that the Africans wouldn't really push this beyond where they did. Um, because Simply because it's they're in the middle of a pandemic in which China is a, a massive partner. Um, they, uh, they have to negotiate debt, uh, you know, kind of rescheduling with China at the same time. And... You know, I, I think they, they had to deal with the domestic political fallout. And, and this this was for me one one major indicator was that, um, you know, this is, I think, really the emergence of of the netizen community in Africa as a political force, um, particularly in Nigeria. And I think um, we're seeing an early indicator that nationalist sentiment on the Internet in Nigeria is going to be a, a, an issue to deal with in the future in African politics. Um, at the same time, Time, um, it kind of shook out the way that I expected it, which was that people will end up blaming local authorities in Guangdong. 
um, and that both sides would be happy to blame to blame Guangdong provincial government and call it a day. Um, and but I think what what's going to be the issue from now on is how it's whether it's going to with there's going to be uh, ongoing political fallout domestically in Nigeria and in other African countries. Whether you know, kind of in the future, African opposition parties are going to be using this as a, as an an example to to slap the government around with. So let's get the big picture from China to understand what what happened, what it means, what where are we right now in all of this. Was this a rupture in China-Africa relations, as I suggested last week, or is it just one of the bumps on the road? And for that, we are thrilled to have back on the on the show one of our regular guests over the years, Hannah Ryder, who's the CEO of the Beijing-based development consultancy, a Development Reimagined. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us. Thank you for having me, Eric and Cobus. It's great to be here again. I saw you commenting throughout the week, both on Twitter on various WeChat groups and also in the press as well. And it was changing quite a bit, your comments over the past week, as the events were changing. Where are you now, one week at one week later? And, and again, the same question that I asked Kobus, how are you processing everything that's happened in terms of your outlook on, on where we are? Thanks. Thanks, Eric and, uh, and, and Kobus. And thank you also for, for your wrap up of, of what's been going on so far. Look, I think the one word that uh, I want your listeners to leave with and to really understand and have at the forefront of their minds and thinking about this, and it has been at the forefront of my mind as soon as I found out about this, is uh, agency. This is about Africans getting to grips with and shaping the relationship that they have with China uh, as a key development partner uh, and trying to shape that future. Um, African governments have demonstrated that they've taken these sorts of issues elsewhere as seriously uh, as they would, as they have done here in in China. Um, You know, and there are issues happening with African migrants and African diaspora communities in the US, UK, France, Saudi Arabia, all over the world. Um, And but what's interesting here is that this is really the first time that this agency has really strongly been demonstrated uh, in China. And so uh, that needs to be taken seriously. And what's been very helpful is that the Chinese government has apologized uh, for those problems and that the African governments are now trying to reassure their nationals uh, that actions have been taken and of their own discrimination policies. Um, That said, I don't think we can say this is over just yet. We still need to uh, evaluate the impact of what Guangdong have done so far the Guangzhou authorities Guangdong authorities have done uh, on the ground there are still people who are in quarantine they still have questions um, and in addition uh, the there are there were some other instances of xenophobia and discrimination that were both uh, reported from outside of the African community and also outside of Guangzhou so those questions are still up in the air it's not very clear uh, but in general, the evaluation of this, as we wait for the next few weeks, that's what's going to determine the, the real re- repercussions on international relations, trade, and I guess diplomacy too. What did you What did you make of the of of what seemed to me the Chinese being caught unawares by by the the scale of the reaction in Africa? You know, I think I think everyone is kind of used to ignoring African social media, but in this case, it seems that they couldn't ignore social African social media. Um, did you Did you think that the that the Chinese authorities were sufficiently prepared to actually deal with the fallout of this? Well, I think it was a reaction from both. From both ends. So, from the African, uh, from the African people on the ground, of course, they were speaking to their uh, consulate generals. Who there's uh, twelve consulate generals form- that are formally established in Guangzhou already. African um, consulate generals that are established there, and so they'd already been speaking to them about what's happening and been alerting them to what's happening. Now, what was an issue is that the consulate generals had not been. Uh, they hadn't been notified by the Guangzhou authorities of what they were expecting to do. And I think perhaps that was a was a surprise on everybody's end. But that diplomatic coordination happened at the same time that uh, Africans in China were sharing their stories to the rest of the world and also to Africans back home. So it was that combination of factors, uh, both on the diplomatic side and also of the people-to-people side. And I think this is, again, something that, you know, 
we need to we need to think about in future you know uh whatever we around the world uh people are connected and covid-19 is demonstrating that connection but it's also bringing out really difficult challenges uh, for communities all over the world and especially marginalized communities so uh it is incumbent on governments to really try and 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 frame their responses to those marginalized communities and and to and to do with as best as they can because actually those marginalized communities themselves are also having to do public goods at the, all the time um so the fact that Guangdong authorities hadn't hadn't really reached out properly to them was a major um problem um and of course the chinese government have recognized that and that's that's the right thing to do um but yeah it was it it happened very very quickly that's for sure uh, that coordination happened very quickly but again as i mentioned at the beginning this is about agency that coordination is also about agency the african uh, ambassadors are coordinating more they speak to each other more um the consulate generals themselves do and african groups do you know you've got student associations that are um are not just kind of broad as africans but you've got nigerian student associations you've got kenyan student associations uh, south african they were all actually mobilizing and and looking after each other as well as uh, as well as those who um as well as just relying on their embassies i thought that this crisis highlighted really the dilemma that comes with the splinter net that is that the chinese are on one internet and the outside world's on another internet and so what happened and, and that kind of was really exemplified in the video that went viral last friday with ambassador joe and the nigerian speaker of the house of representatives when the, when the speaker said have you seen the videos and the ambassador said no and a lot of people said to me there's it's impossible how could he have not seen the videos well hannah you and i both know that if you live in china you're not on facebook and you're not on twitter and even government officials in think tanks in diplomacy uh they're not on even though they may have vpns but they don't use them very often or they're discouraged from using them and so people were looking at two very different narratives here in africa and the outside world there were all of these very emotional videos that really got people upset and in china people didn't see any of that so they were at cross purposes and i'd be interested to hear your take on that as somebody who is in china looking at what the what the world is like there in terms of not having access to facebook and twitter where all this was happening and also on the african side where people were getting very emotional over the distraught sense that they were getting from people living on the streets of Guangzhou for a night or two. Sure. Um and I think what we also have to remember is that there were a number of other videos that were circulating within China as well which had um prior to all of these challenges which had also indicated some real problems happening on the ground in Guangzhou. Let me just explain to everybody those there's two instances in particular and maybe you can tell me there are more but just so where we catch up The first one that really caught everybody's attention was a 47-year-old Nigerian man in Guangzhou who was tested positive for COVID-19 was being treated in a hospital. He tried to escape from the hospital, assaulted violently assaulted a nurse, bit the nurse, and pictures of her and her her treatment and her condition uh, went viral and that caused a lot of fear. Then uh, on I think it was April 10th or 3rd, I'm sorry, April 3rd, there about about that time there was a group of nigerian men who were in a restaurant uh five tested positive for covid id that too went viral on chinese social media are those the two instances you're talking about leading up to the event uh, there's also one more of some people in qingdao as well which was a, a black man with and and two white people who had a uh, shouted chinese get out in a line for testing um that also went out which again also provoked uh a lot of outrage and so on and i would also mention that there was another uh, video of uh, well so a wechat article which uh was showing foreigners uh black men and 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 white men being put into trash uh so these sorts of uh these issues were bubbling under the surface but then uh the nigerian uh case in particular with the nurse uh, was attributed directly to guangzhou and the same thing with the restaurant and then uh more stories started coming out now those stories uh were not just circ- circulated on facebook and and so on actually within china 
And within the African uh, WeChat groups, there's we use WeChat, uh, and within those groups, those videos were coming out and being shared uh, quite a lot. So these were the videos of, uh, for instance, uh, the Nigerian Consul General, uh, who uh, very much kind of uh, showed himself to be uh, kind of defending uh, the Nigerians on the street and making sure that they had their passports with them, that they weren't taken away from them, and this sort of thing. Um, so all of those things were circulating. But I have to say, Eric and Kobus, much of the, the, the issue with this is the real story really remains very difficult to piece together. It is really not clear as to exactly you know, what happened, who messed up, why was there, why did these cases even arise? How did people in quarantine leave? How, you know, how did a nurse get bitten? We, we don't know any the real story behind it. And in some ways, it's not really the point. In some ways, what we need to think about is what are the, you know, what are the implications? What are the end goals of the different stakeholders involved? And then, and from a, from an African perspective, the end goal is to make sure that African people have are in a safe environment, that they are in a free environment, and they can, you know, study, do business, and get things done in China as much as anybody else can. And so, it's really about um, kind of making sure that that de- zero discrimination message is disseminated not just in Guangzhou, but all across China uh, at the same time as the messages around, uh, messages around, look, China's, you know, this issue is going away, Guangzhou are, are dealing with it, it's going to be okay. Uh, that other message about zero discrimination also needs to go out at the same time. Hannah, at the beginning you mentioned the issue of agency. Um, where do you think this leaves African agency where we are, like, you know, from, from last week to this week? One of the quotes that uh, that you didn't uh, pick up on, I think, was uh, from one of the from the deputy chairperson uh, of the African Union uh, Commission in a meeting with the uh, Chinese ambassador to the African Union, Liu Yuxi, and that quote is: "Africa values its relationship with China, but not at any price." Further acts of brutality meted out to Africans will not be countenanced by the African Union and indeed all Africans. And I think that that is a quote really worth reflecting on here in terms of not at any price. And I think that's been, that's the case with many other countries, you know, but it is going to be the future case for many other countries as well as China. What we see happening in Africa and with the leadership uh, of African of African countries at the moment is a real push towards regional integration, coming together, trying to solve problems together. We've even seen that with COVID-19, with uh, Africa CDC. We've seen it with, you know, what Ethiopian Airlines is partnering with Alibaba to take all the medical goods across the continent. A real continental perspective, a kind of pan-African perspective if we want to go back to the, to the 60s and 70s. Um, and it's that that we need to, that, that I think China, but also other countries need to start really taking into account and, and featuring into their international development work and partnership with African countries. Um, you know, at the moment, Africa is kind of marginalized, uh, even the fact that COVID-19 got to African countries so late, in a sense, is very clear, um, is, is a very clear indication of that. But on the other hand, the speed at which African governments have dealt with, have started to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, to deal with issues such as this in China, is an indicator about the future of that agency. And that agency is just going to grow and grow. Um, So it's something that China, I think, certainly needs to deal with. And I also think other international development partners need to deal with too. So sticking with the agency idea, I'd I'd like to kind of bring you my my column today that I wrote for our daily newsletter subscribers. And the, the thought, because I was personally a little bit surprised in how quickly Nigerian senior leaders turned, that they didn't kind of, you know, they, they, they changed their tone so fast. And, and again, for me, it was kind of hard when the Chinese were saying, just hard to understand, not hard to accept, but hard to understand, that when the Chinese were saying there's no discrimination, it's all alleged, it's all rumors, and yet a lot of African people were seeing for their eyes, with their own eyes, hundreds of videos, pictures, and accounts of clearly something had gone wrong. What, that, what went wrong, okay, is up for dispute, but something had gone wrong. 
And so when people, when the leadership kind of, the Chinese leadership said, no, everything was, is, there's no discrimination, that was hard for a lot of civil society level people to accept. But African leaders quickly kind of turned in line with the Chinese talking points on Monday and Tuesday. And I guess it brings me up to, so what I wrote today in the newsletter was, you know, po- you know, this never made it to the prime minister or the presidential level. This was only handled at the foreign minister level across the continent and at the AU. Ramaphosa, Kenyatta, Buhari, none of them really got involved in this. And my takeaway from this was, and I'd love your honest assessment of it, was that they, they said, well, let's play this out. What's the end game for us? If we drag this out for three or four weeks and really make China kind of push them, the Chinese will dig in their heels. It won't be good for us. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of debt negotiations. We've got, you know, in Nigeria, they're fighting not only COVID-19, but they're also fighting Lhasa fever. And their economies, as Prime Minister Abayi Ahmed of Ethiopia said, are staring into the abyss. This is not the time to get into a big fight with a major trading partner and who's been a good friend of Africa for a long time as well to get into a fight. So wrap this up. Let's get past it. We got bigger things to do. That was my takeaway today, that it just wasn't in any national interest in cold, real politic terms to, to, to drag this thing out much farther. Even if there was a moral legitimacy and your people wanted you to do it, there's a populist reason for doing it. Strategically, it's the wrong way to go. And that's why all of these Nigerian kind of stakeholders so quickly said, you know what? Yep, let, let's just go. What's your, what's your reaction to that? So first of all, I want to just be really clear. I don't think the Nigerian, I don't actually think the Nigerian uh, foreign minister has completely turned around. I think what he, so it was reported in uh, Chinese state media that uh, he says there's no discrimination, and that there's no evidence of discrimination. That, uh, from what I heard and what you also just played in, in other parts of his, of, of his press conference, I'm not sure those were words that he actually said. Uh, however, what he did say and what he recognised is that the Chinese government have committed and publicly committed to to deal with this problem. The thing is, there aren't many details, and I think you know this comes to an issue about building that agency in terms of working out what is an African kind of position on different issues. Uh, how can this? How can you know? And a detailed one, not just an overarching one. Um, this, the issue of the discrimination um, of in, in Guangzhou certainly was did go to president level. It's just that it was dealt with, as you say, um, at the foreign ministry level. Um, but presidents were definitely aware. Oh, yeah, they were aware, but publicly they weren't engaging on it. Yes, but also the fact that the African Union Commission uh, also uh, spoke to the foreign minister is also a, a, big, a big deal. At the same time, what they what they also understand, and I think you know, this is where there are similarities, certainly between African and Chinese societies, is uh, enforcement is always a real issue. You know, there's a government position on something, um, and how do you get your citizens to actually get to do those things? That's a challenge of governments all over the world, and uh, even with COVID nineteen, we're realizing that uh, many other countries have the same challenge all around the world. Um, and so, you know, what they recognized, it, it seems to me at least, is that the government needs some time to uh, deal with this and to try to make things better. I'm not saying that they will completely make things better. I do believe the issue with regular migrants, as in people with no documents, no papers, uh, valid visas, is not yet dealt with, for instance, and we can talk about that later. Um, but they they made some commitments and uh, and I think since African governments do have many many other more pressing issues to deal with and also many large African uh, migrant populations that they also have to deal with you know there's reports of over three thousand uh, Ethiopian workers being uh, uh, being deported from Saudi Arabia and the UAE at the moment you know the UN is heavily involved in that there are so many issues that they have to be dealing with and so. If another government can say to them, look, we've got this, don't worry, we're going to sort this out, then that's fine. And you have to trust that. They have to trust that process. And of course, they have still, they've got ambassadors here, they've got representation here. So um, they've also got to trust that that briefing will still be coming up, that they'll still be understanding, you know, they'll be checking in on what's going on. And if there is a problem, then they'll raise it again. Um, So 
I think we we also as the public also need to trust that trust that process, um, but still keep a watching eye. And that's what that's what diplomats, what um, the UN does all around the world. Hannah, what did you make of the US reaction to all of this? Like there was there was real glee <laughs> to, you know, to my mind um, in really jumping on it um, and then using it to, to characterize the entire China-Africa relationship as, as essentially based on lies. Like wh- what was your take on that? Well, I was pretty uh, unhappy to see the US being brought into it Effectively, because this is a this is a, an issue between African migrants and uh, and others and China. At the same time, uh, there were African Americans who had also been affected in Guangzhou, and so it was important that the American embassy uh, gave them advice and directions as to what to do. Uh, you know, so you know, and there are people who are dual nationals of who are there African people who are dual nationals of many different countries. And so that is important that their governments also respond and make sure that they're being uh, looked after and well treated. So I didn't see that as an issue. I think uh, the bigger issue is uh, it shouldn't, there's no need to politicize this. And if you're going to politicize this, the politics is simply between Africa and China. It doesn't need to be between anybody else. Uh, But also just take into account that African uh, nations are, are willing to, African leaders are willing to speak up on behalf of their own citizens. I mean, and that's going to be the case everywhere. Hannah, what, what did you make of the role of social media in this particular, and in, in particular, I'm returning to the to the role of Nigeria and social media particularly. Um, it, it was interesting for me that Nigeria, you know, this is the second kind of blow up in the Nigeria-China relationship in a, in a few weeks. Before that, there was the the very vocal resistance in within Nigeria of against a Chinese medical team that was that was sent to to deal with COVID um, nineteen problems there. And then this very united voice from from the Nigerian medical establishment that we don't need this help. Um, it, it seems to me in, in, we're in an interesting moment where Nigeria is is really kind of emerging as a, as a leading voice in a new kind of online African nationalism slash African pride, you know, like a, a kind of a thin-skinned kind of, re- you know, reaction to slights, perceived slights. Um, what, what, what did you make of the role of Nigeria in social media and all of this? Well, looking at, the, looking at it more from the, from the Chinese side, I think part of the reason why Ni- Nigeria was so uh, at the at the forefront of all of this is that certainly in Guangzhou they're more organised. Uh, there's a there's an association of uh, for, for Nigerian uh, business people there, um, and a lot of the 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 initial targeting had been uh, to to Nigerians, and they're the ones who were on the street. Um, I have to say, I think uh, they were there were also a lot of Kenyans also talking on social media. Um, about what they what was going on with them, less so uh, South Africa, which is which is another kind of large social media um, country that uses a lot of social media. But also other countries like uh, some Sierra Leoneans were affected, um, uh, definitely Tanzanians. Um, so it's not it wasn't just Nigeria, and I want to make that very clear. Uh, Zambians too, and. It was actually a lot of the consul generals working together, uh, for example, in Guangzhou, who, who tried to who tried to deal with this initially. But I think you know we do live in a world of social media, as you said, uh, Kobus, and uh, that means that problems will get out quite quickly. They do need to be dealt with swiftly, and um, and if that ends up being the majority, Nigerians are talking about it and and helping kind of open that up for the rest of the world. I don't think that's a problem. It's kind of, uh, if you look at the political level, of course, Nigeria is doing its its own uh, uh, push. At the same time, we also have Ethiopia trying to, trying to push for debt relief for the African continent with regards to COVID-19. We've got South Africa, who's uh, chair of the AU at the moment. So I think the, the power plays all across the different countries uh, are all there, you know, and Kenya is also going for a UN Security Council position, uh, an observer position. Um, so these are these are things which are constantly evolving, but fundamentally, the leadership means more agency, uh, and that social media engagement engagement of citizens means more agency, and the response uh, of politicians 
has to also has to also come and it has to come swiftly. So I think, yeah, it just it's just a sign of our times, the kind of times that we're living in. Here we are one week later after all this has happened. The news is kind of getting back to what it was. Debt relief is starting to happen. More aid is going. Jack Ma's donations are making across the continent. And that's where we've been for the past six to eight weeks in the China-Africa relationship. Uh, and so where are we going to be two, three, four, five weeks from now? Is And what was the lesson learned from this whole experience? And if you could give us kind of a point of view of what you think the Chinese might have taken away from the lesson learned and what you think maybe the African side. And the African side, of course, as you did point out rightly, is very, very diverse, not just Nigerians. We focused on Nigerians in part because they are the largest population, but by no means the only population. But try to summarize to us what you think some of the key lessons learned on both sides might be. Well, I think... Um Look, we've we've also been speaking as as a as a consultancy firm, speaking to a number of uh, different organisations in China, uh, and and also the diplomatic community in China as well. Um, we don't we definitely don't know where this is going to go. Um, it's still unclear. Certainly, the Guangzhou authorities have said that they're going to update, that they're going to deal with it, uh, but there are still some some a lot a lack of clarity. What we've suggested is that there are there is more clarity on, for example, issues around uh, whether how irregular migrants are going to be dealt with in China, uh, which many other governments across the world have uh, started to be clear about what they will do. We've also suggested clearer reporting about how uh, where different uh, different cases of COVID nineteen are coming from. Uh, with regards to nationality, different communities, that sort of thing, um, and and also a very strong anti-discrimination message uh, domestically in China. Because, as I said uh, right at the beginning, this is certainly the biggest flashpoint has been in Guangzhou, but there have also been other instances reported elsewhere of less less strong discrimination. That's for sure, but um, uh, certainly still still forms of discrimination. Uh, so so we still need to see that, but I think. And, and coming back to your point at the beginning, Eric and, and, and Cobus, about what does this mean for the big picture? Look, the future is around, is, and post COVID 19 as well, what we're seeing is real challenges with regards to just de de is depending on certain very restricted supply chains, depending on the normal ways of working and not thinking about risk consistently through what we do. Um, in the past, we've talked about how, uh, you know, China is the world's manufacturing hub right now. That has been, you know, a lot of that, that, that challenge is, has come up under COVID-19 in terms of dependency of other countries. Africa wants to be the world's future manufacturing hub, wants to kind of bring, and, and that's where it sees the relationship with China going. Now, is that going to be disrupted? It's pretty unlikely that those sorts of kind of long-term visions are going to be disrupted. But what certainly what this, this case really shows is that the risks of that relationship needs to be thought through more clearly. And people to people uh, working and understanding between different communities needs to be increased. And, and politicians... Uh, or need to be thinking about that consistently as they go forward, as they try to bring that vision to to, to the future. So, uh, to to bear. So, I think that's if there's anything that it that it indicates is the is the importance of that within the COVID nineteen context, which has just made uh, you know so many people around the world uh, you know be sadly discriminatory as well as also bringing out the best. Uh, within within other people. So um, we have to take that into account. We have to deal with it. And hopefully we will all come out, even after all this discrimination, we will come out stronger. Hannah Ryder is the CEO of Development Reimagined, a Beijing-based consultancy that uh, does some amazing work. Let's do a little bit of what we call in the U.S. log rolling for you. Uh, you've had a couple new reports coming out. One of you've got is an infographic on COVID-19. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that and what you guys are doing. It's not necessarily directly related to China, but it's about Africa. It, it's a great infographic. Tell us a little bit more about that. 
Thanks. Yes. Well, thanks for the opportunity. That's great. Um, well, this was meant to be our priority actually this week, and it and it is. But uh, having had to deal with this news this week, it has been an extra challenge to that. But uh, what we what we wanted to look at was what are the African governments actually doing uh, to implement economic and social support measures uh, for their citizens, and to not only just show what they're doing and on a kind of easy to uh, digest way through infographics, but also highlight some of the uh, top examples, those countries that are really seeming to make a very strong effort on this. So um, we've got we've got a kind of list of 10 top performers. And what's interesting about it is that some of those countries are the poorest countries in the world, you know, like Niger um, and others with a bit more resources and getting more resources like Ghana, who just got a um, an extra... Uh, loan from the IMF to deal with it. These are, you know, countries are acting, but they're definitely going to need much more support. So we wanted to to bring those points together, not just to inform people about how their countries are doing respective to others, uh, but also to to help the international development community also understand where the extra support is going to be required. And if people want to find that that report and all the great things that you guys are doing at Development Reimagined, where can they go? Uh, we just do our website, www.developmentreimagined.com. Uh, and for those of you in China, uh, we do have a WeChat official account, uh, also Development Reimagined. So please just, uh, ju- just find that as well. And you're on Twitter as well. What's your Twitter handle? HM Rider. And our uh, our company uh, Twitter handle is Dev Reimagined, D-E-V uh, Reimagined. Okay, I'll put links to all of that in the show notes for everybody to follow. Thank you so much for extending your day for us today to kind of give us a perspective on everything that's been going on for the past week. We really appreciate it. And uh, it's great to have you back on the show again. Great. Take care. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to hear Hannah kind of reflect on on the big picture. One of my key takeaways on all of this is... I think China definitely won the narrative kind of short-term battle. I think they've 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 kind of buried this. It, they're moving on. It's you know you know the the story's going forward, and and that's what they wanted. I still, from my reading of social media, and that is a very limited window into all of this, but as from a distance, that's what we can do. Is that there are still quite a few hurt feelings, uh, both among Africans in China and Africans in uh, in Africa. And, and people, and even other people around the world. And China's done very, very well in managing its relationships with governing elites and also certain elements of African media. It's found it to be more challenging to manage its reputation in civil society. And so, and civil society today is much more difficult, more fragmented because of social media and because we're all connected, but we're all in our different feedback loops. And I think it's going to be more difficult for them to shift that narrative in that part of the of, of the equation. So this story's over now. So we're, we're putting it to bed, and uh, but it, I don't necessarily think it's gone. No, I think that the, this particular chapter of the story is over, but I think it's what we've seen now is, is kind of inklings of a much wider story. And that is, you know, okay, this is for me a few things. One, one is that we both saw the incredible efficiency of Chinese official... Uh, communication channels and Chinese public diplomacy, right? Those those ambassadors were on it, like very very quickly. But we also immediately saw the limits of those of those mechanisms. Um, and I think that the the their their efficiency and their their um, usefulness ends roughly around where African social media begins. And um, African social media, I think, has proved a lot stronger than than anyone had anticipated. So I think this is going to be the 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 power of Africans to speak back, to talk back directly against China, to against other international actors on social media, I think is really only starting now. I think it's going to be the more young Africans coming on social media with, of course, Chinese built data networks and Chinese made phones, um, the the more of a handful African social media is going to be in, in the future. And I think I think this is going to be, this is a, a, an early skirmish in what's going to be a much longer kind of like polit- political force slowly emerging now. 
So we'd love to know what you think. If you have feedback, you can reach us on any of our social media channels, but also you can email us directly, eric at chinaafricaproject.com or kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. We'd also like to invite you to sign up for our daily newsletter and become a subscriber. Uh, we talk about these issues in minute detail. I mean, really in a granular level every single day. So if you are following China Africa relations for work or for school, uh, we have academic rates that are 50% off, or you're just interested in the topic and what Kobus and I are kind of reflecting on. And at the same time, we're doing a comprehensive daily digest of media review. Uh, it's really unlike anything else that's out there. Uh, head over to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you part of our, our reader community of diplomats, journalists, analysts, policymakers, bankers, all of those around the world uh, who are following this newsletter now. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another show. Until then, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>